Question 11. Which of the following is the least likely motivation for globalization among state actors? A, intrinsic gain, B, currency exchange, or C, access to resources and markets. So on A, intrinsic gain, um, this is a byproduct or a consequence that results in a benefit that overlaps profit. That's like the proper definition. So I think a good example is China over the years, they'd been the manufacturer of a lot of the different technology that was uh, designed and produced by the U.S. Um, but over time, as they've been manufacturing those products, they've become a lot more knowledgeable and are now able to be the engineers or designers in some cases of those products. So this is definitely a good motivator for globalization because it helps um, it's helping them gain more knowledge. Uh, B, currency exchange. This uh, doesn't seem like a huge motivator just for globalization. I mean, if a country wants currency, uh, different currency exposures, they can just use financial instruments and um, get currency exposure that way. They don't need to necessarily trade with other nations. Um, and have globalization. So I think B is going to be our answer, but let's just rule out C. Access to resources and markets. This is uh, certainly a strong motivator for globalization. Uh, so we will go with uh, answer B. Number 12. Suppose your portfolio has declined in value from 1.24 million to 1.114 million during the year. The continuously compounded rate of return is closest to minus 12.48, minus 10.71, or minus 6.21. So the formula we're going to be using here is our uh, continuous rate formula, which is going to be the natural log of uh, 1 plus our holding period return. And that 1 plus our holding period return can just be uh, ending value over starting value. Uh, so basically, we're going to just take that ending value, 1114000. We're going to divide it by that beginning value, 1240000. Uh, and then we'll just uh, take the natural log there. And we get minus 10.71%. Answer B. Question 13. What most likely happens to the consumer surplus of the importing country when tariffs are imposed? Consumer su surplus increases, consumer surplus decreases, or no change. Um, so I brought in our graph here to kind of illustrate what's going to be going on here. Um, so just as a reminder on the consumer, on consumer surplus, the consumer surplus is going to be this top triangle here. And it basically is just um, telling us the difference between the equilibrium price and that price at the top of the demand curve, which is the highest price that um, any one consumer would be willing to pay for that. So the consumer surplus is going to be that difference here. So we think about what um, tariffs are going to do um, for imports. So basically, it's going to be a tax. And the country that's importing isn't going to want to absorb that tax or absor absorb the full tax. So what they're going to do is they're going to increase their price. So their price is going to go up this way, meaning that um, there will be less demand for consumers. So right now our equilibrium's here. Uh, what's going to happen is that supply curve is going to shift to the left here. So we might end up somewhere uh, in this range um, for the new curve. And so what that's going to do is if we were to just draw a, a straight line over here, let's see if I can get it straight. That's eh, not too bad. Um, we can see that our consumer surplus triangle is now smaller. So we can see our answer is going to be B, consumer surplus decreases. Question 14. Kim Richard has been looking for at ways to increase efficiency in the construction process, especially with regard to fuel consumption. She ran a regression explaining the variation in fuel consumption as a function of distance, 
The total variation of the dependent variable was 160.85. The explained variation was 80.15. And the unexplained variation was 100.7. She had 60 monthly observations. The standard error of the estimate in the regression is closest to. So we have all the variables we're going to need to plug into our formula here. So I'm just going to pull in that formula. We can look through that. So standard error of the estimate is going to be the unexplained variation over n minus 2. Um, so we're just going to be putting in that 100.7 divided by 60 minus 2, so 58. And then we're going to take the square root of that. So I'm just going to plug it into the calculator here just to check our work and make sure that's correct. So we've got that 100.7. We'll divide it by 58. And then we can just hit our square root button here, and we see we get 1.31765, uh, round up a 1.32. Question 15. When inventories start to accumulate, the inventories to sales ratio reaches its above normal level. Which phase of the business cycle is most likely associated with an increased inventories to sales ratio? Peak, trough, or expansion? So our inventory to sales ratio is pretty simply going to be um, what it says there. So it's going to be inventory in our numerator and sales in our denominator. So what this can kind of tell us is when sales are higher, which is a good thing, this ratio is going to be lower. And when inventories are lower, which is also going to be a good thing because it indicates high demand for our products, this uh, number is also going to be um, lower. So we're going to be looking for the business cycle peak here where which is either leading to decreased sales and increased inventory or some kind or both basically. Um, so I think right off the bat we can get rid of expansion because during an expansionary phase um, we can see that GDP is growing which means sales activity is going to be high. We're probably not stocking up inventory. We're able to sell the inventory where, that we have. So this, the numerator is going to be low. Denominator will be high. That'll probably be a below normal level. Um, at the trough, <clears throat> this is where we probably have already offloaded a lot of the excess inventory we maybe had at the during the contraction. So during this contractionary phase, we maybe built up some inventory um, due to anticipated demand, which wasn't met. So while our sales are going to be low at the trough, our inventory levels are also going to be very, very low. Um, our inventory levels will be low too, so this number will probably also be pretty low. It won't be super high or above normal. Um, so that leads us to peak, which is going to be our answer. Um, as we're going through the expansion and then as we're getting closer to the peak, remember this is when um, s demand is starting to slow a bit. And so in anticipation of continued growth, businesses were probably continuing to order a lot of inventory and keep growing. Um, but now at this point, those inventories are probably starting to accumulate, as it mentions in the question, um, leading that ratio to increase. So we're gonna go with A, peak. Question 16, if the exchange rate of euros in terms of dollars has increased from 1.12 USD to Euro, USD Euro to 1.24 USD over Euro, then the most likely impact on prices of goods denominated in Euros <coughs> is that euro denominated goods cost less in terms of USD more in terms of USD or the same in terms of USD so the key thing we're looking at here is we're buying euro denominated goods so we need to, with uh, US dollars per the answers here so we need to figure out what the USD did relative to the euro and we can just cancel out number C here, or uh, answer C here, because we know that the exchange rate changed, so there's going to be something, some type of change. It's either going to be less or more in terms of USD. So we start with uh, 1.12 and we go to 1.24. Because USD is in the denom or is in the numerator here, 
This is telling us that it costs us 1.12 USD to buy one euro. And then later on, it costs us more USD to buy one euro, so 1.24. This is going to indicate to us that the euro appreciated and the USD depreciated. Um, so if we're buying, if we're needing to transfer our dollars to euros to buy these goods, it's going to cost us more in terms of USD. Answer B. Question 17. The correlation coefficient of Microsoft and Apple's stock returns is 0.7. The return variance of Microsoft is 0.004, and the return variance of Apple is 0.008. The covariance of Microsoft and Apple's stocks is closest to... I'm going to pull in our formula here. The covariance formula for these two variables is um, going to be our correlation, so that 0.7 number between the two stocks. And then it's going to be the standard deviation of the stock of stock X, which we'll assign to Microsoft, and then standard deviation of stock Y, which we'll assign to Apple. The tricky thing with this question is it doesn't give you the standard deviations explicitly. It gives you the variances. Um, so we know to go from variance to standard deviation, we just take the square root. So we've got our 0 0.004 variance for Microsoft. Plug it into our formula, we're going to do 0 0.004 uh, square root. And then same thing for Apple here. We're going to take that 0 0.008 and do the square root. Uh, once we have those, multiply it by that 0.7 and we get our final answer, 0 0.00395, answer B. Question 18. Which of the following is the name given to the demand curve in an oligopolistic pricing strategy? Vertical demand curve, kinked demand curve, or horizontal demand curve? Vertical demand curve um, is going to be a monopoly, so we're going to be able to cross that off. So just to kind of level set on that, looking at this graph here, kind of ignoring the kinked demand curve for now. Monopoly is really going to be selling at any price they want um, at the quantity demanded by the consumers. So it's just going to be a straight straight up and down line because there's no other competition. Um, the consumers will set that quantity and then the monopoly will be able to set the price that they want. Um, for horizontal demand curve, this is going to be perfect competition. So price is going to stay the same no matter what the quantity is because producers will enter um, if a higher quantity is going to be need to be made and that price is going to stay at um, where the marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So it's not going to be C either. Our answer is going to be the kink demand curve B. Um, and so this is the phenomenon that happens when a few firms have control over the pricing. Consumers are going to have different levels of elasticity um, at different price points, which is um, what this creates here. So we can see at the higher prices, um, consumers are going to demand uh, more as we go out on the com as we go out on the quantity curve. Um, but then at a certain point, there's a huge drop off in that demand just because of something where um, consumers can't physically consume more than they're able to. Think about it from an airline perspective. As prices drop, you can tra you may travel a little bit more to a certain extent, but then once you get to a certain point, you only have so much vacation time or um, ability to pay for the other stuff on the vacation. So even if the prices drop way down, you're not going to demand a huge quantity greater. So these oligopolies, they generally try and stay at the top of this curve here because it's where they have a lot more pricing power. They can drop prices just a little bit and um, increase the units that they're selling um, greatly. So long-winded way to uh, get us to our answer B. Question 19. Which of the following is least likely a benefit of having strong institutions in a country with respect to geopolitics? All right. A, they allow countries to engage internationally with independence. Yes, this is certainly going to be um, a benefit of having strong institutions in a country. B, so that's not going to be an answer. We're going to cross that one off. B, they contribute to more stable internal and external political forces. Um, that will 
also be a benefit of having strong institutions. Um, stronger institutions is going to equal more stability. And then C, this should be our answer, but let's just uh, make sure that's the case. Increase in the likelihood of a country defecting from its cooperative rules. So this is going to be uh, corrupt behavior, um, and I think we know that having stronger institutions is going to lead to less corrupt behavior. So we can confidently put answer C. Question 20. A survey is conducted to determine if the average starting salary of investment bankers is equal to or greater than 57000 per year. Given a sample of 115 newly employed investment bankers with a mean starting salary of 65000 and a standard deviation of 4500 and assuming a normal distribution, the test statistic is closest to... All right, so first we're gonna pull in our test statistic um, formula. Make this a little bigger here. So we can see our, uh, we're not gonna have all the variables we need for this quite yet. So we're gonna have our sample mean here, which is going to be um, that 65,000 from our sample of 115 investment bankers. Then we're going to subtract our hypothesized value, so 57,000, um, which is what we're testing it on. And then we're going to need to pull in the standard error of that sample mean. Uh, so the standard error of the sample, to calculate that, make this a little bigger too, we're going to take the standard deviation uh, divided by the square root of that sample size. So we're also given those numbers here. So we've got our standard deviation of 4,500. We see that right here. Then we're gonna divide that by the sample size, 115. Plug that in here. So we can see this 419.62 number is what we're gonna end up putting in here um, at our standard error, the sample mean slot on the test statistic formula. So we pull in that answer or all the variables here. So we've got that 65,000 minus the 57 uh, divided by that 419 number, we get 19.06, answer B.